embarrassing moments happen to everyone at some point. And uh, I think it becomes, it's actually more awkward if what is embarrassing is something that was otherwise a good thing in one context, but in a different context is not so good. Not so good. I, I say that because uh, just during the week, I was thinking of embarrassing things that happened. I remember when I first heard of, uh, a, many years ago now, a little child who just did not like going to the, to the loo. And if he goes to the loo, a little boy, I don't know, he must have been like one or two. He, 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 would, he, he was okay doing a number one. I don't want to be polite here. But he just would not, he found the whole number two issue not for him. And I, when I was first told this, I was thinking, oh, just, you know, eventually he'll go, I thought. Well, believe it or not, there's a whole, like, medical situation here. This kid just would not go, so we went for counseling and all that. And the counselor said, you know, you just need to encourage you, you need to help, and all these kinds of things. I think it was him, actually. They bought a, a, all kinds of potty in a car. You know, it's a potty, but it looked like he didn't like any of that. Eventually, Actually, with a lot of encouragement, you know, uh, he began to go to the loo, and he would do just a normal party, and they would, anytime he does his number two, they would, well done, well done. And uh, he became so happy about the fact that he could do this, number two. Well, this is fine until he keeps growing, and then one day uh, there are visitors in the living room, and he turns up with a party in hand, look what I've done. <laughs> exactly true. Look what I've done, and... Um, you know, expecting the mom to say, well done, and all this. And she kind of had to say, well done, but this is not so well. And it's not, <laughs> I can see it's been done, but it's not so well. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it was an embarrassing moment. Well, there are different embarrassing moments that one can, one can talk about. I, this, this story that was read to you actually has exactly that. It has an embarrassing moment in it. It starts off setting up the way it is, Luke chapter 7, the prostitute, and the Pharisee, or the way I've written it, the Pharisee and the prostitute, is the title of this song. The Pharisee and the prostitute. Two categories of people who would have nothing to do with each other, nothing at all, nothing to do with each other in those times. And frankly, you, will, you might say, sad to say, even in these times, we'll have nothing to do with each other. They are different, they are distinct, and they're very distant from each other. They wouldn't even walk on the same side of the road to each other. They, the Pharisee on the one hand and the, and the prostitute. This story in the Bible brings both of them together into the same chapter and then puts a prophet in the middle. A prophet in the middle, the Pharisee and the prostitute. And the way that the whole scene is set up, let me help you here. It begins with an invitation. Jesus Christ is invited to a meal by a man who is a Pharisee and his Simon. And Simon sees Jesus, obviously being here, what Jesus is all about, and he invites Jesus to his home. Well, that's strange for a start. Because Simon, the Bible says it right here, is a Pharisee. And Pharisees in those days, these are people who knew the Lord, these are people who knew uh, 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 you know, the Torah, they knew the way of God, so to speak, and they pretended they lived it. They didn't really live it. But they had enough pretense and charade all around them that everybody thought, you know, these are holy men. These are holy men. And when they walked on the street, they made sure trumpets were blown so people could know there's a holy man coming to enable all the prostitutes cross to the other side of the road because this is a holy man. Well, imagine now when a real holy man turns up in town who in his own holiness also performs miracles, signs and wonders. And he begins to show up the Pharisees. They're not happy about this. They're not happy about this because the Pharisees saw themselves better than other people. They saw themselves of better value before God than other people. And so they were harsh towards people and they were in fact hostile towards Jesus. They were hostile towards you. Very often they had questions. And it wasn't because they wanted to really actually know and get an answer. They were questioning him because they were wanting to, wanting to make him fall or to show him up. And very often, frankly, Jesus would just say, not answering the question. Other times he would answer the question with another question. Well, there were, however, a number of the Pharisees who were not hostile. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 was not hostile. He came to Jesus at night to learn. This one we see here, Simon, was not hostile because he invited Jesus. And inviting Jesus to his home, there they are. Jesus is there. Uh, the table is set. Uh, there are other people there, if that's the way it would have been. 
because every people followed Jesus wherever he went. And so wherever he went, there was always a crowd. And the Bible tells us they're sitting down, there's food. Jesus is sitting down, reclining, he's resting in the home of a sinner. Some people are so Christian, the last thing they want to do is have a non-Christian friend because they don't really understand Christianity. If you understand Christianity, you will be like Jesus who had all kinds of friends without ever defiling himself. Here he is in the house of a Pharisee and he sits down reclining at the table. It's all going well. The food is there, the peace peers are there, the people are there. When all of a sudden, somebody else is there. That's all to do with the invitation. Let me talk to you about the interruption. A woman turns up. Well, that was, that's, this is not good already in that context because they would have many, many men do the main thing. Well, a woman turns up in the middle of this party and she comes right into the middle, right into the center and she goes right to Jesus. This was just like unbelievable. Especially when you consider the fact that this woman who invades this occasion and disrupts the meal, this is a woman that is known as a woman of the city. It didn't mean she wore skirt suits to work. It means she had a different kind of work in the city. A woman of the city, a sinner. And we know that her hair was let down because in a few moments she's going to use her hair. For your hair to be let down in those days, it, it connotes the idea of a loose woman. This, this is describing to us a prostitute. Describing to us a prostitute. And she comes... She bursts into the scene as if that's not enough. She's the kind of woman that nobody wants to say they know. And she's coming in the middle of such an event, such a moment. As if all of that is not enough, she immediately goes to the guest. And that's Jesus. And as if that is not enough, she doesn't go to shake the guest or give him a hug. She goes down to his knees and begins to take his feet and begins to cry all over his feet. Her tears are falling down, and she tears are falling on her feet. So she takes her hair, not her dress, she takes her hair and begins to wipe his feet. When this is being wiped, now she takes the perfume she has in the alabaster bottle, she breaks it open, begins to perfume his feet. What would that look like if on a Sunday morning you go to church in the middle of the worship, some lady turns up, breaks the alabaster bottle at the feet of, I was going to say me, but it's not me. It's great. <laughs> Comes, suddenly comes at the feet of one of the pastors, breaks the puts the perfume, stroking the feet. You'd be like, okay. How do you know her? This is, this is, this is like unbelievable. That's happening right here. The invitation, the interruption. Talk to you now about the imaginations. What do you think the people were thinking? If you were there, even just, just narrating the story to you right now, what are you thinking? The people there would have been there thinking, my goodness, my go this, is, this, is, is this is this not Simon's house? This is a Pharisee. This is like a holy guy. Prostitutes do not come to the house of a holy guy. Unless, of course, if there's something else going on behind the scenes that we don't know about. I mean, she's ruined the meal. She's ruined the moment. And then, what do you think Simon is thinking? All their imaginations. He's, he's frankly is embarrassed and disgusted by the whole thing. You, you, you know that from his comments. You know, because this, people would not have been uproaring and shouting. It would have been a silent moment except for a woman who is in the middle of this crowd and is weeping and tears and her hair and perfume and the whole thing just does not look right. And in the middle of that silence, what do you think Jesus is thinking? Well, he breaks that silence by letting you know what he is thinking. There she is. And he says, Simon, I have something to say to you. Just like wh whichever auditorium you're listening to this, perhaps the Lord has something to say to you. I know that for me, reading this, the Lord had a lot of things to say to me. Simon, I have something to say to you, he says. He says, well, no, speak on, Lord. It says, a certain money lender had two debtors. 
One owed him 50 denarii, the other one owed him 500 denarii. He says, and neither of them could pay. They both could not pay. And so the money lender decides to cancel their debt. So he cancels their debt. And then he says to him, now this is my question to you, Simon. Which one loves more? Which one loves more? Well, Simon gives an answer. And Jesus says, well, you've spoken well. You've spoken well. But I'll tell you this, by now, Simon is realizing. Up to that point, Simon was thinking, this guy, Jesus, who is he, really? Is he really a prophet? Because if he's a prophet, he should know what is going on here. He should know that this, this woman, he should know, this is not a righteous woman. And if you're a prophet, you don't just sit there while a strange woman is struck. What kind of a man is, he's, he's wondering about Jesus when Jesus tells him this very parable in two sentences. Profound, he gives him this parable. And by, oh, by now, even you can decode this parable. Simon realizes, this guy knows me. This is the first point I want to bring to you. God knows your thoughts. God knows your thoughts. God knew exactly Simon's thoughts. Every bit of it. God knows beyond what you might have on the outside, he knows what's going on on the inside. He knows you. By now, Simon is realizing when he says, is this guy a prophet? He just read your thoughts and ended it with a question that relates to this whole situation. You bet he's a prophet. He's realizing, yes, he is a prophet. God knows your, not just does he know your thoughts, he knows how you think of him. So when Simon is there wondering, trying to stand dignified, but the whole time he's thinking about what kind of guy is Jesus? Maybe that's you today wondering what kind of person is Jesus? He knows your thoughts towards him. Not just that, he knows your thoughts towards other people where he said he should know about this woman, this sinner. Oh, he knows how you view other people. He knows that clearly. Not just that, he knows how you view yourself. You view yourself, Simon, as better than this woman. He knows your thoughts. He knows my own thoughts. He knows the thoughts of your mind. Number two, he knows the depth of your sin. He knows your sin. You see this parable that he told? In this parable, he, he, he's making a very profound and important point. And it's a point that all of us need to hear, starting with the preacher this morning. Because we all have a tendency to think that other people commit sins but we make mistakes. We always think that for other people, whatever they've done wrong is really wrong. But whatever we do wrong is slightly inappropriate. We have a way of marinating things that we do wrong so that it comes off not too bad. But when it comes to somebody else, you feel like poking them in the eye and saying sinner. And you may not even say it, but you think it. And the one who is in heaven sees your thoughts. He sees your thoughts. He knows everybody's sins. The tendency to think, oh, we just had a momentary mistake. We had a slight slippage. I slipped. It was just a little thing. Well, you see, when it comes to this woman, the story is different. Jesus says there are two debtors. One owes 50 denarii, probably a month's wages. The other one owes 500 you know what he's trying to prove here? Sin is sin. This is important for everybody to know. Sin is sin. It's really important because you'll never appreciate the gospel until you understand that sin is sin. Sin really is sin. Whether it's 50 or it's 500, it's still sin. But Simon doesn't think that. Simon thinks, my goodness me, I may have one or two little things wrong, tiny, wrong with me. But by goodness, I'm not like her. I may be a 50, but I'm not like, I'm not like her. What are you? Sitting down here, cool. What are you? Where, where would you place your own sin, really? Would you place yourself at a kind of a 51? Fif 
it, you know, I, if you, I've done some bad things in my life, you know, even when you admit I've been really bad, you still don't want to go to 500. No, you want to go you know, 100, 101. Put one extra one there. If not for last week, I would have been at, I was at 38 last week. But by the time my husband did what he did and I showed him, and, and now I'm particularly angry with him because whereas I was at 38, on my way to a one. Now I'm in the other direction now. Look at me now, 49. 49. Things were going well, now I'm at 49. And it's his fault. And the minute, the minute you begin to blame, 50. Oh, no, no I, don't want to, I don't want to be a 50. I don't want to be a 50. You see what you've done now? 51. You see, you see, you're, 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 52. And it all, the, it's just getting worse the whole time. Let me tell you something about us. We are natural sinners. It comes easy to, it's what we do. Sin, sin is what we do for free. 50, 500, you're all in the same boat. The, this, is, this, is, this is how we kid ourselves. For some people, their sins are external. In her case, it was. For others, it's internal. And we think it's better because it's internal. But he sees everything. The difference is, in her case, her sin was sexual. In his case, the sin is pride. I'm better than, I'm better than, I'm better than. In her case, her sin is unrighteousness. But in his case, it is self-righteousness. I'm trying to tell you, sin is sin. You can call it whatever you want, sin is sin. Oh, there are different types of sins. There are even different degrees of sins. But the nature of sin is all the same. And sin, God will not look on sin. And to really shock you even more, God hates sexual sin, but he hates pride even more. The average self-righteous person thinks, at least I'm not like that person committing sexual sin. God hates sexual sin, but he hates pride even more. He hates sexual sin because sexual sin really shows you have no fear of God, you're going to do what you want to do. But self-righteousness shows that you replace God. You replace God. You decide, I know they say you are God, but I have a few different ideas. I'll choose another God. Really? Which God are you going to choose? Me. I choose me. So when you say, thou shalt have no other gods before me, I just chose me before you. And the whole time God is looking at it. Self-righteousness is so subtle, is so internal, seems so cute, and it's all over the place with Christians and non-Christians. And it's a grotesque sin. It's a horrible sin. You know why I say they're all the same? Jesus says, they both owe. Number two, they both cannot pay. Number three, they both need a savior. He canceled it. He canceled it. They both need help. The point is this. All have sinned. Romans chapter 3 tells us that. Verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. That is peace green, joy green, uh, ponder's end, uh, wherever you come from, Chinese, Eritrean, Filipino, that are, all have sinned. The next verse 10 of that same chapter, Romans chapter 3 says this. The non-righteous, no, not one. That, do you know why it says no, not one? Because there's always somebody trying to say, well, I'm not sure. That, uh, say, there is non-righteous. Somebody say, well, excuse me. No. No, not one. That's a big, no, not one. Self-righteous people always think, I've done good here. And Isaiah chapter 64 says this. Your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Your righteous, you think it's good because you've been told so long, good, well done. You did a poo in your potty, good. You did a poo in your potty, good. Now, all your life, you keep turning up in living rooms showing people poo. And you think your poo is okay. Look what I did, I'm good. But they're too kind to tell you, you stink. Thou stinketh. 
There are people that go around right through life like that. Look what I have done with my own. Yeah. Look what I have done. Look what I have done. The, the worst thing is they turn up in heaven saying to God, let me into heaven. He's like, why? Why would I let you into heaven? You won't believe what I've done. He says, show me. Pooh. Let me in, Pooh. He's like, no. No, stand back. Stand back. He's like, is this not enough? I have a lot of poo. He's like, this is not good. This is not. Your righteousness is like that. Your righteousness is like, you are the only one impressed with it. God is not impressed with it. Simon stands there and he thinks that he has it all made. He thinks it's fine. God, Jesus is going to show him that righteousness of yours is horrible compared to this woman. It's horrible compared to this woman. Oh, he knows your thoughts, the thoughts of your mind. He knows the sins of your soul. Number three, he knows the state of your heart. Right now, listening to this sermon, I can categorize everybody into three different categories. You have the saint, the person who is a Christian. You have the sinner, and you have the one who is seeking God. The saint, the Christian, let me tell you, first of all, this, this parable... As short as it is, I think it might be the shortest Bible in the whole Bible. It speaks to you, Christian. It speaks to you because it's trying to say this. He who is forgiven more loves more. And you get to know the person's love by what they do. And this woman's love is unbelievable. It's just over the, it's everywhere. When she comes in, she does not care what anybody is going to say. The tears, the hair, everything. She gives everything. Lavish grace, it turns out, evokes lavish devotion. They say, where you worship, you worship that way because that's how deep your love is. They say, where you serve, you serve that way. It's an indication of what your love is. If you love me, you'll be like this. Complete and absolute devotion. Service is an indication of love. That's for the sin. Let me say something to the sinner. Because this man, Simon, he really is a sinner here. But he didn't know it. Oh, pride. pride. If the Pharisees were known for anything, it's self-righteousness, which is a product of pride. And God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Pride. I cannot, I'm too big to do that. I don't associate with these kinds of people. I don't do this, I don't do that. There are certain visitors that I'm careful how I ask. You know what? Jesus looking and said, Simon, I came to your home and you did not give me any water for my feet. You didn't give me any water for my feet. You, you, you've invited me to your home, but you're not really embracing me here. Don't think I don't know. I do know. But this woman, he contrasted and said, she's come here and she's been crying. The tears have gone on my feet and then she's used her hair to wipe it. You didn't even think of a towel. You did not nothing. Since I came into your home, you did not offer me a kiss. You did not exactly welcome me with a kiss to the right and to the left and really embrace me so that everyone can see, my goodness, Simon the Pharisee is really all about Jesus because you're not really all about me. There's a way you're doing it where there's a distance that you're setting this whole thing up because you have your status to maintain. You did not embrace me. He said, look at her. Since the time I've come, she has not ceased kissing my feet. Not just kissing my feet. Till I came into your home, you did not give me any oil to anoint my head. But what she has, she's given. The perfume, everywhere. All over the place. Therefore, says Jesus, her sins, which are many, for he is a prophet and he sees right through. Her sins, which are many, that's deliberate there. They're all forgiven. They're all forgiven. This is how Jesus forgives. Totally. Not partially. Totally. The saint, the sinner, but the seeker. Because I don't think most people are going around thinking, I just hate God and that's all there is to it. 
I think many people are like, I don't get it, I don't understand, but I'm seeking. They're seeking. Maybe you're here this morning and you're seeking. You know, the way this woman was seeking is the right way. It says, verse 38, she came from behind. She did not come in a pontificating posture before the Almighty. She came from behind. It's, it's an indication of a kind of uh, reticence and fear. Will he accept me? Will he not? Will he accept me? Will he not? But he really does accept her. Because in verse 44, when the whole time he's speaking to Simon, speaking to Simon, he gets to a point, and the Bible says, and he turned toward her. This is Jesus for you. You can have a crowd of 5,000 people, and he's speaking to one particular person. He turns towards her. And while he's still speaking to Simon, he's addressing her. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. You never found acceptance greater than this. Acceptance greater than this. You know how this story ends? At the end, there are some people still thinking, oh, forgive sin, who can forgive sin? Uh, the Pharisees are like that. They're, they're like that. You know, Jesus could do a miracle if a man walked here, he has no head. And Jesus does a miracle and a head grows. Pharisees would be like, well, I'm not sure we should be doing that on a Friday. Should we be doing that on a Friday? Is this right? No, oh, Sabbath. I'm not sure. We're just checking the technicalities of all this. A head. This guy had no head. Now a head has been grown. Look, he's talking. Is it me or is this just like a mighty miracle? Well, you know, we've got to follow the rules. Pharisees are all about. Jesus just did an incredible thing. And here they are. Verse 49. They're like, oh, forgive sin. I'm not sure about can we forgive sin. Who can forgive sin? But God. And he ignores them concentrates on her and says to her, verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has, those words are highlighted for you in red that you may not miss them. Your faith, coming to Jesus is a matter of faith. I believe, I trust you. I walk, I come to you. It's not a matter of everything you've done, it's a matter of faith. Your faith has saved, you can live today Saved. You can live today saved by God. And the best of it, he says, go in peace. What would you not do to have peace for your soul? You may say, well, I'm fine. Got my money, I got my own bank, mortgage, everything is paid up. You got peace with God? You got peace with God? You get to heaven, God is going to allow you into his heaven because you got peace with God. This woman, he said, go in peace. Let them do their arguments. Let them do their pontificating. Let them judge whether they're clean or not. You're clean. You're free. You've got peace. I want you to close your eyes as I pray for you.